to point out why inverse problems are so important. Well, I'm sure you all heard about the, the famous French mathematician Laplace, and probably most of you also heard about Laplace Riemann. So Laplace Riemann is some kind of a supernatural being that Laplace was thinking about, and this supernatural being he postulated would know all forces and all positions of all items in the now. So he he's postulated a supernatural being that would know all the parameters now in the universe, would know all particles, uh, position would know all particles, velocities, and the supernatural being he postulated should also have an infinitely computational power. So if the supernatural being knows all laws of nature and has infinite computational power, and he knows everything in the present state, then this supernatural being, the Laplace demon, should be able to predict the future. And Laplace was talking about this or thinking about this from a philosophical point of view. So he was thinking about whether human can have a free will if, there, if everything is determined by, by nature's laws. And, uh, and if it is determined by nature's laws, then there cannot be something like a free will. And of course, this is more like a, like a philosophical question. But really, what Laplace Demon is doing is what we are doing in computational science. So in the last couple of decades, there has been a really big, big increasing um, money has been, has been invested in a lot of universities for departments on computational science or simulation technology. So we saw a big increase in computational powers. Computers are getting better and better. And so we can now, we have the laws that describe nature, and we can try to use the computer to solve these laws and to predict what nature does. So if we know the parameters that describe the world, we should be able to use a computer to predict what the world does. So we should, we should be able to simulate an experiment in a computer rather than doing it in reality. And there are three big goals that are connected to this problem. So the first goal, of course, is prediction. If you think of weather forecasts, for example, when you take a lot of measurements today, the weather, the air pressure, all these kinds of things, and you try to simulate what the climate, the atmosphere does, and so you try to predict what the weather will be like tomorrow or in the next week or how climate change will happen and all these things. But that's not the only reason why we want to simulate things in a computer. We also want to simulate things because we want to optimize something. For example, if you think of crash tests with a car, the car manufacturers, they want to simulate how their cars behave in a crash test. And of course, they don't only want to know how their cars behave in a crash test, but they want to design their cars in such a way that they optimally protect the driver in a crash. So optimization is another very, very big topic when it comes to computational science and simulation. And then the third big topic, the third big goal, is inversion or identification. So if we make an experiment, then we can compare the, the real experiment with what happens in the computer, and we can try to take this comparison to find out what the parameters that describe the world look like. And one of the most important examples there are maybe non-destructive testing or tomography. Um, when you, I think you heard last week, you heard already about some tomography techniques, for example, in electrical impedance tomography. What we are trying to do is we drive electric current through a patient so if we know all the parameters that describe the patient, we can predict or simulate how the electric currents will flow through a patient. But we are not really interested in how currents flow through a patient. But we want to make this experiment in reality and compare it with the computer simulation in order to find out the parameters of the patient, whether there's a tumor inside the patient or optimally to get some kind of an image of the inside of the patient. Now, we can write this in a, in a mathematical form, these problems of computational science. And in a very abstract, simple way to write this down, we could say that we have some kind of an input, some kind of X, which describes all the input parameters, for example, the image of the inside of a patient, or all the measurements of air pressure and temperature on the earth, or all the material parameters that describe a car. So everything we put into this, this parameter value X which should be, let's say, a vector and some very large or infinite dimensional vector space. And if we know all these parameters, we are able to predict the outcome of the experiment. So there should be some kind of a functional relation going from the parameters to the outcome of the, of the measurements. So the prediction problem mathematically means the evaluation of one function. 
and usually evaluating this function is extremely complicated. It involves solving some, some high dimensional PDEs, for example. So, so evaluating f may be very complicated, but there is some kind of function f taking the parameter, the input to the outcome, to the measurements. And then the problem of prediction would be to evaluate this function f, which can be very complicated, solving PDEs, for example. Um, and the problem of optimization would be to find the parameters x that give in some way an optimal f of x. So we have to define what we think of an, an optimal, what we think that an optimal f of x is. And if we know what this is, if we can somehow measure how optimal uh, the f of x is, then we can try to find an x that minimizes some cost or maximizes some, some outcome or things like that. And the problem of inversion or identification is to invert this function f. So if we have given a measurement of f of x, how can we find the parameters x? And of course, there are all kinds of, of problems involved with that. So the, the problem of prediction may be extremely complicated, the problem of optimization may be extremely complicated, and the problem of inversion as well. And it's of course not clear that a solution exists and how, to, how, can, how we can calculate these solutions. So I'd like, in, in this first talk, I'd like to give you a couple of examples. I will um, speak about these examples. I start with the most complicated one, and I end up with the, with the least complicated one. So we'll start with a complicated nonlinear tomography problem, then we go to an easier linear tomography problem, we go to a linear image deep learning problem, and then we end up with a very simple problem of numerical differentiation, which already has a lot of characteristics that inverse problems have. So let's start with, with EIT. And you already heard something about this last week, and I will speak uh, more about this tomorrow and on Wednesday, and Kim will speak a lot about EIT. Um, so just the, the basic idea, to, to stress this again, is that we attach electrodes to the boundary of a patient, and then we drive electrical current through the patient using these electrodes, and we measure the voltages that are necessary to drive these currents. And in this way, we get a lot of voltage current measurements, and we try to get the conductivity inside the subject from this uh, current voltage measurements. And the idea is to have a harmless alternative to X-ray tomography. Um, you, can, you cannot feel these currents. So myself, I, I tried one of these EIT machines, and I couldn't distinguish whether the currents are on or off. And these are in the, in the amount of several milliampere, so it's like these, these body fat uh, testing machines. You cannot feel these currents, and you can keep the current on for hours and hours. They're completely harmless to the patient. So if this really works, then we would have a harmless alternative tomography technique to get an image of the patient. And what people are using this for, at least in Germany, in medical hospitals, people are making tests on this um, for persons that are connected to artificial breathing machines. There you have to, to adjust the breathing pressure. Um, you need enough pressure to fill the lungs with air, but you shouldn't take too much pressure because you don't want to harm the lungs. And you cannot put the person into a CT machine all the time. So if you are there, the patient's lying in his bed with this artificial uh, breathing machine. The idea is to use an EIT machine all the time to monitor the lung of the patient and to see whether the pressure is right for this patient or not. And so there's people are really hoping that they can improve the outcome of, of this artificial breathing by that. And in a generically speaking, this is just an inverse problem. So we have the image, the interior conductivity distribution of the patient. The patient is made up of a lot of organs, and if we know all the conductivity of the organs, if we know where the organs are, if we know how much the lung is filled with air, we, can, we could be able to say how is the conductivity inside the patient. And if we, are, if we know the conductivity inside the patient, we should be able, by solving some laws from physics, to predict how electrical currents will flow through the patient. So if we know how the conductivity is inside the patient, we should be able to predict all the voltage and current measurements. And so what we would call the direct problem is to simulate these measurements, and knowing the conductivity, and then calculating the measurements from that. And the inverse problem, what we have to solve if we want to do EIT in practice, is to invert this mapping. So we have a measurement of f of x, and we want to know x from f of x. And of course, there's a lot of open problems involved with that, whether it is possible to find x of f of x, whether f is invertible, and whether this is stably invertible, and, there, and a lot of problems there. <laughs>
So before I come to the generic inverse problem, how to do that, let's look at another example, which is a little bit more simple because it's a linear one, and that is X-ray computed tomography. So Cormac and Townsfield are two engineers that received the Nobel Prize for inventing CT, computerized tomography. And the idea of CT is you, that you take an X-ray image of a patient, but in a standard X-ray image, you only get a projection of the patient. So if you take an X-ray of your leg from the front to the back, then you cannot distinguish what lies more on the front and what lies more on the back because you only get a projection in that direction. So the idea behind X-ray tomography is that you take your projections, your X-ray images in more than one direction. So usually you take really a lot of directions, think of 500 or 1,000 different directions, and then you should have enough information to distinguish where is what inside the body. And you heard about the radar transformation in the talks last week, it's what's behind there mathematically. So again, we have an inverse problem there. If we know how the patient looks inside, if we know all the optical density parameters inside the patient, um, then we would be able to predict how the X-rays go through the patient. So we should be able to simulate our X-ray projections. So we should be able to simulate what a CT scanner should, what kind of data we should get from a CT scanner. And then the inverse problem again is of course, we have the data measured from a CT scanner. How can we get, go from the data to the patient? And this means solving an equation f of x equals y um, and solve this equation for x. Now there are inverse problems also appear in many other things, not only in tomography. So another important inverse problem is image deblurring. So if I take off my glasses, then I see only blurred images of all of you. And that's because my optical system is not perfect. And you have the same, for example, in, in cheap cameras. So if you have a cheap camera, then, then your image gets blurred. And you can also try to simulate that. So you can, if you know what to think about your optical system, then you should be able to predict how your optical system takes the, uh, how the images look in the optical system. And if this is not perfect, you may say, okay, that's the outcome of this non-perfect optical system as a blurred image. And you can look at this as a direct, as an inverse problem. The direct problem is compare, calculate the blurred image from the true image. And the inverse problem is calculate the true image from the blurred image. And for example, people were making money from this by helping the police um, to improve the images of surveillance cameras. So if you have a surveillance camera and you have some kind of a crime scene and you try to see something on the surveillance camera, it's usually very hard because they are very, very low quality because they should be very, very cheap. But if there a crime happened, you can take this camera, then uh, make images of, let's say, pixels, make a white, uh, take a big white sheet of paper, you paint one pixel on that, you make an image of that camera of this one pixel, and then this will show you how this one pixel gets blurred by this specific camera. You can do this for a lot of pixels, and then you have a discretization of the forward mapping that exactly corresponds to this camera. That gives you the blurred image. If you Then you know the forward mapping app that takes an exact image to this blurred image. And then you can look at the images of your crime scene and try to, to improve it by solving this inverse problem and taking this forward mapping that you generated for this specific camera and then solve this inverse problem with this forward mapping and try to improve your, your images, your blurred images that you got. And the last example I want to show you is an example where, where usually if you've never heard of inverse problems, you would probably not think of this as an inverse problem. And it has a lot of in common with the other problem. And that's numerical differentiation. So in numerical differentiation, you could say that the derivative is the inverse to the primitive. So I could say that taking the derivative is the inverse problem of taking the primitive of a function. Of course, I could also put it the other way around. You could say taking the primitive is the inverse problem for taking the derivative. But we will see that there are some kind of stability issues why it's, a good, uh, why it's good to, to call the direct problem taking the integral, taking the primitive of a function and then calculating the derivative, we could look, we could see this or consider this as the inverse problem of taking the primitive. So instead of taking, let's say, finite differences of a function to calculate the derivative, we could also try to discretize the integral operator that takes a function to a primitive and then try to invert this function of taking the primitive. Then we would have an alternative way 
of the numerical differentiation. Now, all these problems, all these inverse problems, have one property that makes them very specific. The property, the, and, and this is really the reason why they are called inverse problems. I mean, already when, when you are in school, probably in Germany, when I was in school, we were solving equations for a parameter. And then later, when we study calculus and numerical analysis, we do something like a Newton type algorithm where we try to numerically solve an equation for one parameter. So, why is inverse problems? Why has it become an independent mathematical topic and a very important independent mathematical topic? And the reason is what is usually called ill postness. And this word goes back again to a French mathematician, um, Hadamard. So, he, 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 term, he invented or introduced the term well post. And with well post, he meant what kind of problem should I look at in the world? So what kind of problem should I consider? And he said it wouldn't make sense to consider problems that don't have a solution. You will not make any progress with the problem if it doesn't have a solution. And you shouldn't consider problems that don't have a unique solution. So the solution should be well defined. So these two, two items are very, very natural. To, to speak of when you have a problem. And, but he also introduced the third criteria for a well posed problem, and that is that the solution should depend continuously on what you are given, on your given data. And this is also a very important thing, because if you, if you think of a problem that has something to do with, with practice, then in practice you will never have exact measurements. So you can try to measure more and more accurately but if your solution does not depend content continuously on what you measure, then your solution may not, uh, then, then a small amount of noise in your measurements may have a very, very large effect on your solution. And since you can never get exact measurements in practice, Hadamard said it does not make any sense to look at problems where the third item is not true. And if you think of, a, of an inverse problem, like if you have some kind of forward mapping from some space to another, and you want to solve this equation f of x equals to y, then the existence of a solution means is f subjective in the spaces that you post the problem, the, the uniqueness of the solution means injectivity of f, and the third item means does the solution depend continuously on the given data, so does x depend continuously on y, so this is the question whether the inverse of f, if it exists, is continuous or not. And usually in inverse problems, if you think of practical inverse problems, then people in practice don't care about this first point, the existence of a solution. Because if a patient comes to a doctor and lies inside a CT scanner, then obviously there exists a solution. There obviously there is a patient, so the patient has some kind of interior, so there is a solution. So if you have non-subjectivity, if you have non-existence of a solution, this is just because of your mathematical model, because you, you introduce some kind of spaces and maybe noise takes you out of the spaces, and this does have a lot of mathematical consequences, um, but it's not really important for the guy in practice. So if the doctor comes to you with the, with the measurements of a CT scanner and asks you how does the patient look inside, you shouldn't take the data, think about it for, 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 for a couple of days, and then come back and say there does not exist a solution. So, so this is really not really a practical problem. Injectivity is, is really a great problem in practice. Injectivity means, if you think of tomography, for example, can there be two patients that look differently inside? One has cancer, one has no cancer, but they give the same measurements. So if injectivity is not true, then you can forget about this tomography technique, basically. So injectivity is a really great problem in practice, and it's really a problem-specific problem. So for example, in an electrical impedance tomography, there are still some, some open parts of the famous Calderon problem, where we have injectivity for very, very non-smooth data in EIT. So injectivity is usually something that a lot of mathematicians work very hard to study this, this injectivity. Is the data enough to find out about the parameter? <coughs> um, and in, in my first two talks, I'd like to concentrate on the third point, the continuity of the inverse, if it exists. Now, let us, let us Look at this again. So what happens if I, we have an inverse? So think of, uh, let's say, uh, an injective operator f, where we have a left inverse f to the minus 1, or let's say a subjective operator, and you have a real inverse f to the minus 1. What happens if this inverse is not continuous? 
then we have the true solution, how the patient looks inside. We could think of having exact measurements, that we could measure everything exactly if our model was perfect, if we have perfect measurements. But we don't have this in practice. We only have some measurements containing some kind of noise. So let's say we, have, we are giving some kind of vector y delta in some space that has some distance delta from the exact measurements. And the only thing we can, we can hope for is that we can decrease the measurement noise by, by buying more and more expensive machinery. And by measuring more and more, in a more and more accurate sense, we could at least think of making this delta smaller and smaller. So we can hope that we get closer and closer to the real measurement, to the exact measurements. But if f is not continuously invertible, then if we use this non-continuous inverse and our better and better data, our solution does not get better and better. But maybe the solution does not converge against the true solution. And this means that if we have a non-continuous inverse, and if we use this, this discontinuous inverse on our data, even the smallest amount of noise may completely corrupt our reconstructions. So this means we buy more and more expensive things. We get the noise down to 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 16. But what we get out of our image is still totally crap and has nothing to do with the, with the real patient, for example. And Hadamard was really meaning this uh, so, so Hadamard, we have in Germany, we have the saying that some guy was put turn around in his grave if something bad happens after he died. And Hadamard would probably do this because Hadamard phrased this term well-postness in order to prevent people from studying ill-post problems. So Hadamard really meant if you, if you study a non-well-post problem, an ill-post problem, then it's your fault because you post the problem and you should not do that. But the problem is, a lot of interesting inverse problems are ill-posed. So, and the, the easiest example is numerical differentiation. So what I show you here on the left-hand side is um, a black dashed line and a blue line where the black dashed line is some kind of exact function. And the black dashed line is a numerical approximation of that function. And in the left image, you probably cannot distinguish uh, between the black dashed line and the blue line. So you have an exact function and you have a numerical approximation to this function. So what happens if I take some naive finite differences on these functions? Then you see in the right image, I hope you can see the black dashed line, which is a nice smooth curve. So this is, hey, you, this is the exact derivative of finite differences applied to the exact solution. And then what you see in the blue oscillating thing is the finite differences applied to your approximation. So this means your approximation may be very, very good of your function, but your derivative, your approximation of the derivative, is very, very bad. So you can see on the left-hand side, I'm not sure, maybe it's 1% or 0.1% of error, and on the right-hand side, you probably have something like 100% of errors. And of course, you all see why this is the case. If I take finite differences, and if I perturb my function by a delta, then, the, then I have in the uh, denom in the nominator, I have some error of about the size of two delta, and then I divide this by a small parameter h that I choose very small in order to get a good approximation of my derivative. And so dividing by a small h, for example, here it's 10 to the minus 3, dividing by a small h will, will, will be a big multiple, it will give me a big uh, factor that multiplies by my noise, for example, with a factor of 1,000 here. And if I, if I try to make my derivative better by making, taking, choosing a smaller h, things will get much worse. So if I take h to the 10 to the minus 4, I will have my noise amplified by 10,000 and so on. So this means that differentiation already seems to be an ill-post problem. And if you think of it as an inverse problem, then it's an ill-post inverse problem, because taking the primitive would be the corresponding Dirich problem. So if you follow Hadamard, then you should never take the derivative of a function. And that's obviously not possible. I mean, we want to take derivatives of functions. We need them all the time. So, so we have to deal with ill-post problems. And all the other problems I showed you, all the other examples, are ill-post as well. So yesterday, I spent the afternoon in my hotel by calculating these examples. So this image on the lower left is really what comes out. You take an image, you blur it. And, and you can describe this, for example, by some discretized matrix vector multiplication. 
So I describe, take the image, and I uh, take it as a variable, describe it by a very long vector. Then an easy model for deep learning is some kind of an integral equation, which uh, translates into a matrix multiplication with this vector that I can then plot again as an image. So I can implement this function f going from the left picture to the right picture. And if I take the inverse of this matrix, I go back to the left uh, picture. But if I add just a very, very tiny amount of noise, like 0.1% here on the right picture, you cannot see the difference in the, in the blurred picture. But if I, if I invert the matrix, really exact, as good as MATLAB can do this, uh, and I apply this inverse matrix to the slightly deteriorated uh, picture on the lower right side, I get total crap out of that on the lower left side. So even adding 0.1% noise, 0.1% noise in your measurements already makes the deep blurring impossible if you use the exact inverse of your blurring matrix. And the same happens in computerized tomography. If you start with some, some exact interior of a patient, calculate the measurements, add some noise, so here I took 1% of noise, and then try to exactly invert your mapping going from the data, from the parameters to the data, you get total crap out of that. So if you believe in Hadamard, then you should not uh, take derivatives of the functions. If you believe in Hadamard, then, you should, then, then CT scans would not work. And if you believe in Hadamard, then, then image um, improvements, image denoising, what, what all your handy cell phone cameras can do, would not work. So what is the cause of that? Why are these problems? Imposed. And I'd like to give you a very, very brief, very short mathematical introduction to that. And then the reason, the mathematical reason for ill-posedness, at least in the linear case, is compactness. So let's get a little bit more mathematical now. Let's consider a general test problem, like the easiest problem that we could think of, which is an operator going from one Hilbert space to another Hilbert space, f going from x to y. We will only consider real Hilbert spaces, and we assume that f is a very simple thing, so f should be a linear function, it should be bounded, it's continuous, and it should be injective. So this means that there exists a left inverse of our operator f. And um, then we call this operator f compact, if it takes bounded sets to pre-compact sets. This means that we have the image of a bounded set and we take the closure of this in the image space, then this, is called, then, then this should be compact. And this means if f is a compact operator, then if you put a bounded sequence of vectors inside your operator, then the, then the sequence of the images will contain a bounded subsequence. So what you see immediately, and I think this will be one of the following simple theorems, is that if you have a finite dimensional operator, x and y are, let's say, r to, to the n, to some finite dimensional vector space, then every linear mapping, you know, every linear mapping in finite dimensions is bounded, and you see that every linear mapping is also compact because of the theorem of bolzano weierstrass that tells you that every bounded sequence contains an, a, a convergent subsequence. So compactness of an operator is some kind of property for infinite dimensional operators that makes them behave in some sense similarly to finite dimensional operators. And this property of being compact is enough to make the inverse problem imposed. So if you have a compact operator, an operator that is compact, it's injective, so it has a left inverse, then the left inverse cannot be continuous if we are not in the finite dimensional case. If we are in the finite dimensional case, every matrix is a continuous mapping. But if we are in the infinite dimensional uh, spaces, then this inverse problem of determining x from y is automatically ill-posed if f is a compact operator. And I'd like to give you some proofs for that. Prove this. How can we see this? So we assume that we are not in the finite dimensional case. So we assume that the space where our mapping starts from is something infinite dimensional. 
And that's very natural in practice. If you think of an image, then you would usually say that the person consists of an infinite number of pixels. And if you go to, not, to, a, to a finite number, that is because of discretization. But, but somehow this, this number of pixels in the patient should be infinite number in a, in a real patient. So infinite dimensionality is a very, very natural assumption when it comes to tomography, for example, or whenever it comes to images. So, but if, we, if the dimension is infinite, it's infinite, then we can choose an infinite number of vectors that are linearly independent. And since we are in a Hilbert space, we can choose them in such a way that they are orthogonal, and we can normalize them so that such that they are autonormal. So we can choose an infinite sequence of orthonormal vectors xn. Now, we have two vectors of unit length that are um, perpendicular to each other. Then the distance of these two vectors is automatically square root of two, because you just have to look at these two vectors. It's a two-dimensional problem. And then by the, set, by the zero of Pythagoras, um, the distance of these two vectors must be square root of two. When they are not the same. And this means that these sequence of orthonormal vectors, they can never get close to each other. So this sequence xn can never contain a converging subsequence because all these vectors have some finite distance from each other. So this means that no subsequence of xn can converge. On the other hand, all these vectors have unit length. So this means that this is a bounded sequence. And by our definition of compactness, if we put a bounded sequence into a compact operator, what comes out, the image of the sequence, should have a convergent subsequence. So xn is bounded, f is compact. So the sequence fxn contains converging subsequence. Let's call it fxnk. And then we are done, because fxnk converges. The corresponding three images, X and K, doesn't converge. So this means we count a converging sequence of images where the corresponding three images do not converge. And if the inverse of F was continuous, then, you, then applying the inverse to this sequence would give us this sequence. And with a continuous operator, a converging sequence should be mapped to a, to a converging sequence. So this already shows us that f to the minus 1 cannot be continuous. So this means that whenever we have a compact mapping that describes our direct problem, our inverse problem will be imposed. And these compact operators, they appear very, very frequently in practice. And the reason is, the next theorem, every limit of compact operators is compact. So whenever we can, and by limit, I mean the limit in the uniform operator topology. So if we have a sequence of, of, of operators converging against another operator, and the sequence of operators, they are all these items are compact, then the limit must also be compact. Let's do this. 
linear bounded operators from x to y, and they are all compact, and, to, and they converge against f in the strong operator norm topology, so the norm of f n minus f goes to zero in this norm in the spaces of linear bounded operators from x to y. Then we will prove that this operator f is also compact. So this means we will prove that if we have a bounded sequence and we put it inside f, then this bounded, then the, the sequence of images fxn will have a convergent subsequence. So let xn be a bounded sequence. And now we can use the compactness of our operators fn. So we know we have a bounded sequence, we put it into F1, F1 is compact, this means F1 of Xn has a bounded subsequence. So F1 of Xn contains a bounded subsequence. Let's call it X1L, so F1, X1L converges. It's not just a bounded subsequence, it's a convergent subsequence. Now, the same holds true for all the alpha operators. F2, Xn also has a convergent subsequence and so on. And in order to, but it may be a different convergent subsequence. So, in order to prevent this, what we do is we take this subsequence x1l, where we already know that f1 applied to the same convergence, this is also bounded subsequence, and then we apply f2 only to this subsequence, where we have convergence of f1 applied to it, and then we get a converging sub subsequence, where, where not only f1 applied to the subsequence converges, but also f2 applied to the subsequence converges. So, there exists a sub-subsequence, let's call it x2l, and this should be a subsequence of x1l, such that also f2 x2l converges. And then we can go on like this, take a sub-subsequence of this sequence, um, where F3 applied to it converges and so on and so on. And so we get a sequence of subsequences all nested inside each other. And the later we take this, uh, this uh, subsequence, the more of these Fs apply to the subsequence converge. And, and what we then use is a standard diagonal argument. If you think of this subsequence as written in one line of a matrix and the next subsequence in the next line, what we take then is the diagonal of the sequence, and this diagonal sequence will have the property that each f applied to this diagonal sequence will converge. So if we go on like this, and in the end, go on like this, and then consider the diagonal XLL. And for this diagonal we know that for each k the sequence XA, XLL, this x, we know that the sequence xkl has been constructed in such a way that fk xll uh, xkl converges. But xll becomes a subsequence of xkl in the moment that l is larger than k. So after taking away finitely many of these elements, this will be a subsequence of xkl, where fk applied to this converges. So fk applied to this diagonal sequence will converge. <coughs> 
So this is probably a good candidate to have a converging subsequence also for the limit of f. So if it's a null subsequence by each of the f's applied to that thing converges. And so let's see if this is true. What happens with f applied to xll? And we will prove that it's a Cauchy sequence and hence conversion. So let's look at fxll minus fxlm. If we can prove that this goes to zero for l and m going to infinity, then this is a Cauchy sequence, which means that f applied to the sequence converges. And then we use triangular inequality to put in fk. So this is fxll minus fk xll plus fk xll minus fk xmm plus fk xmm minus f xmm Let's see, do I have something to clean this board? Okay. And so if you look at this, then we see that here we can we have assumed that f is linear, so this is equal to f x l l. Uh, this is uh, oh, it doesn't even matter that it's linear. This is the same as f minus f k applied to x l l. This is the same as f f k minus f applied to x m m. So in both ways, I can put the norms inside. So this is smaller than the norm of f minus f k times the norm of xll. This is smaller than the same thing, norm of f minus fk times xmm. And I keep the other term. So let's see if this becomes small. So first of all, this holds for every L, for every M, and for every K. Now, if I choose my K very, very large, then this here will become as small as I want. Um, because this XLL and this XMM, they, they are subsequences of my original bounded sequence. So this term here is bounded. So no matter what L and M is, this first term will be small for large enough k. So if you give me any kind of delta, then I can choose k such that this term becomes smaller than delta half if I take this k. And then with this k, I know that for this fixed k, um, fk of xll converges. So this is a Cauchy sequence. And so this means that for this fixed k, if l and m is large enough, the second term will also be arbitrarily small. So this term is arbitrarily small for the fixed k that I choose for the first term and Lm sufficiently large. So this means that the whole thing goes to zero for L and M going to infinity. And this means that F of XLL is a Cauchy sequence. And since we have complete Hilbert spaces, this means that F XLL converges. Okay, why is it important for our inverse problems? Um, we have seen that whenever we have a compact forward problem, the corresponding inverse problem will be ill posed. And now we see that compactness goes to the limit of operators. 
So why do compact operators be, uh, appear so often? Uh, the reason is the theorem 124 that we already talked about. Whenever we have a finite dimensional problem, whenever our operator is such that the range is finite, then this problem, uh, then, then the operator will be compact. And the proof of 1 by 4 is simply bolzano weierstrass If we have a bounded sequence that's mapped by f into, an in, into a finite dimensional space, if f is a bounded operator, so it maps a bounded sequence to a bounded sequence, so we have a bounded sequence in the finite dimensional space range of f, and balzana weierstrass tells us that in finite dimensions, every bounded sequence has a converging subsequence, so this means whenever our f is some finite dimensional operator, it will automatically be a compact operator. And this means every operator that we can approximate by finite dimensional operators is compact. Whenever we have the limit of finite dimensional operators, it will be compact. So at least in this uniform operator topology sense, this means that every problem you can discretize, every problem that you can discretize and that implement in your computer will be a compact, will correspond to a compact operator because if it's not compact, you cannot approximate it with the computer with your finite dimensional problem. So everything that you approximate with finite dimensional things will automatically be compact. And the last theorem for today is theorem 1.5. So we have seen that, that many operators, everything that can be approximated by finite dimensional problems will be compact. So what does this mean for all these regulations? I mean, you could say infinite dimensional spaces, they don't exist in my computer. So whenever I do anything in my computer, I write it, let's say, in matrices, they are automatically continuous, so I don't have to care about ill-post problems. But this ill-postness also appears in your finite dimensional discretizations. And the reason is the theorem 1.5. Whenever you have an operator with an unbounded left inverse, whenever you have an ill-post inverse problem, and, if, and you discretize this problem, with, um, let's say, any kind of sequence, any kind of continuous um, operators, let's say you discretize it by, by writing it in a computer with matrices, then what will happen will, the closer you get to your infinite dimensional operator, to your infinite dimensional problem that you want to solve, the closer you get to that, the more unbounded your operators get. So of course every finite dimensional matrix is bounded, but they get more and more unbounded the larger they get. So this means if we discretize an ill-post problem, then the better we discretize, the more unbounded our discretizations will become. And I also want to quickly prove you that. So the proof of 1.45. So why do these operators become un unbounded? Let's assume they don't. So assume that there is a subsequence of your discretizations that does not become unbounded. Let's assume you could pick your discretizations in such a way that they don't become unbounded. So assume that R and K, the norm of that, is smaller than some constant or some constant C larger than zero and some subsequence. R and K of your discretizations. Well, assume that your discretizations really discretize your problem, so at least that they, they that you have a pointwise convergence against the true inverse that you want to approximate. So then this means that your true inverse f to the minus one applied to some vector is the limit of your discretization getting better and better. But then this also holds for the norm because the norm is a continuous mapping. And if this thing here is bounded by a constant, then this is bounded by some constant times the vector y. And this holds for all y that you can apply your left inverse f to the minus 1. And this means that your inverse must 
die bauen wird, die bauen wird und die continuous to save for linear operators. So this means f to the minus one is bounded and has hence continuous. And we have assumed that this is not the case. So this means if your f is not continuous, if your f to the minus one is not continuous, then your discretizations cannot stay bounded. And that's a problem that we've seen with the finite differences. The better we try to approximate our finite differences, the smaller we choose the age, the more we amplify the error that's in our data. So compact operators appear, well, roughly speaking, whenever you have an infinite problem that is really infinite dimensional, for example, whenever you have something um, where you're unknown as an image, your problem is inherently infinite dimensional, and whenever you can, this is, a, this is an okay problem, so whenever it's possible to discretize this problem in a good way, then the problem becomes automatically compact, which means that the inverse problem will automatically be ill-posed. And this means if you approximate your ill-posed problem, then you will have a large uh, error amplification, and your error amplification will get worse and worse the higher dimensional your discretization will be, so the more pixels you choose in your image, the, the worse you, the ill postness gets and the higher the, the noise <coughs> amplification will get. So there's no not really a way around ill post inverse problems. They will appear in practice whenever we think of images. And if we approximate them, then we always will have this problem of having a higher and higher noise amplification. Now, Let's look at the problems that we have considered so far. So for all the problems that we have considered so far, this compactness can really be shown in a rigorous manner. So in fact, you can show that everything you can write as an integral operator is also automatically compact. So this means taking a function to its primitive is a linear compact operator. This means the inverse problem is imposed. Taking an operator from the x, looking at the operator takes an exact image to a blurred image is a linear compact operator. This means the image, the inverse problem of image deblurring is automatically imposed. And you can look at this problem of computerized tomography, taking the image to the measurements, the Radon transformation. This can be shown to be a linear compact operator, so the inverse problem of CT is automatically imposed. At an EIT, this doesn't really fit into the setting because it's a nonlinear problem, and we have a lot of other problems coming from the nonlinearity there. But we can at least show that the Fichet derivative of the format operator EIT is also a linear compact operator. So this means if you linearize your EIT problem, then the linearized problem that you get will become an ill post inverse problem. And in the last few minutes of this, this first talk on inverse problems, I want to present you just in a sketchy way the general idea why inverse problems, why ill post problems can still be solved in a stable manner. And let's look at this easy differentiation example again, where we have a true function, we have some kind of an approximation, and we see that the finite differences applied to the true functions and to the, and to the approximations behave differently. The finite differences applied to the approximation seem to, seem to have a very, very large error amplification. Now, this is a very simple problem that we can just explicitly study the error that we make. If instead of taking the true derivative of some function y of t, we use finite differences applied to an approximation of this function y delta of t. So if we do this, then we can use the triangular inequality and see how much of the error that comes from using the finite differences so, and how large is the error that comes from having noisy data. And then this first term is how good do the finite differences approximate the true derivative. This is some standard knowledge from your numerical analysis courses that the, this error goes to zero at the same order as h goes to zero. And if you choose your h smaller, then this first term will go to zero. And the second term is also easily studied where you make an error of delta in, y of, in, in your function y. So you have two deltas in the nominator and you have the h in the denominator. And so, you comp so your total error will be this term here. And if you look at this term, if you fix your delta, if you, have, if you have a fixed approximation of your function, and you just choose a very, very small h, then this term will go to infinity. But it doesn't have to go to infinity. 
if you choose your age in such a way that it corresponds nicely, it fits nicely to your error delta, for example, if you choose h equal to the square root of delta, then this term will go to zero. So if you don't try to, make, to use the best possible finite differences, but you rather try to adjust how good you approximate your inverse with how much noise we have on the data, you can still make this term go to zero. And that really works in practice. So if I don't use finite differences of a very small age, but if I choose my age in the order uh, something around the square root of delta, then my finite differences behave fine. So this will be, you still see some kind of noise. Of course, we had some noise in the data. You will see, see, uh, see some noise in the derivative. But it's much, much better than what you see if you just take a very, very small age. And that's already the, the big idea of regularization that started this whole mathematically topic of inverse problem. We have a problem where the exact inverse is not continuous, so that generally if you use the exact inverse on the noisy data, we, we get totally crashed out of that. It will not converge against what we are looking for. It will not converge against the true solution. But we have seen with this finite difference example that if we don't take the exact inverse, if we don't try to choose a very small age so that we exactly approximate our differentiation that we want to do, but if we take a continuous approximation to our discontinuous inverse, and if we choose our continuous approximation in a nice way, so if we adjust how good we approximate the problem with how much noise amplification we can deal with. If we do this in a nice way, then at least for the finite for the differentiation example, we, we have seen that using these continuous approximations, the so-called regularization, we may still converge against the true solution. Even, and so, so it's better to use this regularized inverse than using the exact inverse. And that's the whole idea of regularization. We use an inexact but continuous reconstruction and we adjust the amount of inexactness and continuity to how much noise we have in our data. And in the end, we will have convergence that we don't have if we use the exact inverse. So to sum up this first introductory talk, um, inverse problems are extremely important. We wouldn't have tomography techniques if we couldn't solve inverse problems. We wouldn't have image improvements if we couldn't solve inverse problems and parameter identification appears in many, many um, topics, many, many subjects in computational science. Whenever we have infinite dimensional problems, this at least often leads to ill-posed inverse problems. Even linear problems will then be very complicated. And these inverse problems have the big problem of ill-posedness, which means that the better we discretize them, the larger the noise amplification gets. So if we think we are doing something good and we take a great discretization, but we are doing something bad, then the noise amplification gets too high. But there are ways to stately solve inverse problems. They are usually called regularization. And they are based on this big idea of balancing the noise amplification together with how good is our data, how good is our approximation of the data. And if we balance them in the right way, then we may still yield convergence that we don't get if we just solve the inverse problems as good as we can. And we will learn more about this from a generic point of view in the second lecture on the Tiffin of regularization that will really prove that every ill-posed linear inverse problem can be solved in a convergent way by, by using a simple idea that's known as Tiffin's regularization. So, thank you for listening. Um, so, Professor uh, Bastian Wanhara's lectures are on the, so uh, he has posted his, uh, the slides on his website and the prop, uh, the program web page i have linked uh, i have given the link to his web page so if you want to access it you can go to our website the program website and then you'll be able to access his slides